they could see me now on Howard's TV show. I swear I never... It'd be dishonest of me to say that the people I tend to talk about are unusual and often unsavory characters. And perhaps today's topic is a perfect example of that. As I've demonstrated in my videos over and over again, I'm a bit of a dork and I enjoy digging into the finer points of internet and radio history, mainly because I enjoy picking through the remains of catastrophic train wrecks. As such, the person I'll be looking at today is the perfect kind of bizarre. A truly unique and boisterous individual who, while briefly present, changed radio history and our perception of cunning con artists. This is the tale of a man who sold a VHS tape of a woman rearranging his exit. The legend of a man who ran a $30 million criminal operation to the ground. This is the story of Elegant Elliot Offen, his audacious criminal misadventures, fashionable legacy, and uncertain future. Elliot Keith Offen, known better as Elegant Elliot Offen by the millions of Stern fans who were fortunate enough to listen to him scream into a microphone for many years, was a recurring guest on The Howard Stern Show and a notable nobody from the Upper East Side in New York City. This guy has made quite a name for himself within that community, turning heads with his bombastic presence and appearance. He was quite infamous, being known for jogging wearing tight women's clothing, particularly athletic outfits that show off his unmatched physical prowess. He's alleged that he started doing this back in the mid-80s, but there is very little evidence to support this. However, in 2000, he claimed that he ran 15 miles a day for 15 years, but the women's attire was something he started donning in the last 10 years or so up to that point. Considering Elliot was running around in multicolored outfits that really showcased the roundness of his rump and this being the early 2000s, seeing someone wear a certain set of clothing would often get some upset responses. As such, the denizens of the sleepless city would shout unpleasant words and phrases at Elliot in an attempt to shame him. This didn't matter, as it merely served to bolster Elliot's decision to show off the musculature of his legs. But yeah, he would get all dolled up and hit the town, pushing his body to its limits and setting the goalpost further. But this isn't all there is to Elliot. His presence is an unparalleled experience compared to what you get from most normal people. As not only is he highly fashionable and totally fucking bonkers and angry, he's got some obvious issues with volume control. At almost any time or when he's engaged in conversation, the decibel level of his voice gradually rises and his vocabulary gets more colorful. He sprinkles in various words into his dialogue, spicing up the delivery of his message with what he refers to as his crescendo. I, 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 yeah, keep laughing, keep giggling, ah, keep giggling. But, I, but, we're, but I'm here with Violet and I live in the Mondrian in a $750,000 condominium due to Howard Stern. How's it going, How's big that? guy Stern? You're putting him up How's in the Mondrian? How's it going, Stern? His word choice is usually formulaic, centered around an idea or theme and almost always accompanied with some form of rhyming or alliteration. There's an almost eloquent quality to his screaming. It's elegant, if you will. Before we look into the significance relating to the public's perception of him, we should really roll back the clock a little bit to get a better understanding of how Elliot's mind works, at least to the best of our ability. According to an article that was published to the Sun Sentinel newspaper on the 9th of September 1986, Elliot historically has had many problems. This article detailed the dubious nature of Elliot's alleged illustrious criminal empire. Law enforcement and the feds were hot on his trail. Turns out, Elliot used a variety of different names and identities during his illegal escapades, switching addresses as necessary in order to make his trail harder to follow. And he could have possibly had cash or valuable items hidden in scattered locations from the sun-soaked streets of Fort Lauderdale to the packed corners of New York City. Right? No, I'm gonna burn him, right? On September 8th, a press release regarding Offen's nefarious actions was pushed by the Broward Sheriff's Office, the Florida Department of Law Enforcement, the State Attorney's Office, and the FBI. Offen was wanted for racketeering, organized fraud, grand theft, and conspiracy. These were all charges tied to his ultimate goal, a planned bankruptcy of $30 million. For all of you drooling Zoomers, he had a five-star wanted level. Make sense yet? Elliot was arrested in Connecticut with his then-girlfriend and his daughter. He and his girl were arrested on minor offenses, but his daughter was taken into custody. Elliot, being the slippery bastard he is, managed to post bond before he was recognized as a wanted man. It was stated that Elliot had kidnapped his own daughter and kept her as a prisoner. He isolated her from other people, school, and of course her own mother. She wasn't even allowed to know her own name. His little girl was unfortunately not only a hostage, but a tool, or rather an accomplice, to his crimes, as he used her as a means to satiate his desire for criminal mischief by incorporating her into his schemes. We'll touch more on his daughter later in the video, but her experiences with her father lasted some years before she eventually got picked up by the cops. He had trained her very well as she wouldn't give up any information about her old man. 
Elliot tried to get her back via a handful of ruses that all inevitably failed, ranging from manipulative letters and phone calls to using different identities and accents to full-on threats. His most recent girlfriend at the time, under the pseudonym of Randy Jacobs, stated that he psychologically overpowered her and beat her, controlling her life in the most violent ways imaginable. He even threatened to kill her at some point. What a sweet guy. She claimed, quote, he's dangerous, he should be off the street, we're talking about a very brilliant man who is a very sick man. He can convince anyone of anything at any time. Not entirely sure how someone who screams rather than speaks can be convincing, but hey, I'm not here to guilt someone over being hurt. You're a fucking rusty nail! You're a fucking hey, recluse you? husband! You look like You're the last shit was. I took, right? You're a never you look was. like the last shit I took! You're you look a like the last was. shit I took, right? Regardless of his daughter and his ex-lover both being in custody, Elliot was hardly deterred. The investigation against him was elevated in importance once it was discovered that Elliot was previously institutionalized as a mental patient, and his violent tendencies were also something to be considered. His love of crime culminated into an operation involving four companies and six warehouses to order loads of valuable items, estimated at about $30 million, and he didn't pay a dime for it. His ultimate goal was to take the items that he purchased on a phony line of credit from small entrepreneurs and interested organizations before selling all of the product and declaring bankruptcy. This didn't go exactly as planned as the Glowies were already a few steps ahead of him. According to John Coffey, who at the time was a Florida Department of Law Enforcement agent, Elliot's printout of his arrest record in just New York alone was eight feet long and ranged from minor infractions like littering to weapons charges and criminal trespass. Kind of fascinating. Violent wackadoos are just floating around in the world with no repercussions for their heinous actions. Kind of strange how that works, huh? Elliot's father and brother were also victims of his vapid tirades and episodic blow-ups, as he stole from them both and even somehow had a hand in his brother's fall from grace into homelessness. Pretty much everything he would touch would turn to crap. Some years after the publication of the last article, on November 29, 1989, another story was published to the same newspaper yet again covering Offen's outlandish story. Turns out Elliot was sentenced to 14 years in prison on the 28th of November. It was revealed at this point that Elliot managed to pull off a series of bullshit bust-down operations totaling $1.8 million from 18 individual companies, some of which were devastatingly dismantled from his actions. All things considered, he did a staggering amount of damage for being just one single person. He'd spent the last 14 months bullshitting and filibustering with the law offices, doing everything in his power to deliberate and inevitably delay the case. Or really, he was just postponing the inevitable, as if putting it off was going to prevent any kind of prosecution from happening. Elliot had cut a deal with some fraudulent creditors who told merchants that Elliot and his credit were A-OK, -okay, which helped the process move along swiftly without any setbacks. Perhaps if he wasn't such a self-absorbed asshole, he'd actually be prolific in his career of crime. Or maybe he would have done something good. Hard to say at this point. Often was interviewed regarding his sentencing, where he stated, quote, It's been a nightmarish, harrowing experience for me. My freedom is too valuable to me. I want to be a law-abiding citizen from now till death. Of course, he never properly followed through with this proclamation of reform. But hey, it happens. It'd just make too much sense to turn over a new leaf and integrate back into society by not being a fraudulent fuckhead. Right. And to this day, Elliot claims he was released after just about a year of being incarcerated because he was such a model inmate that they just had to bestow pity upon him and set him free. But now that we have a better understanding of his involvement in the shadowy corners of the criminal underbelly of America, we can finally move on to the more interesting stuff. His experiences with crime and punishment changed Elliot, enlightening him of his own being. Through this tumultuous period in his life, he discovered that he had a deep admiration for physical health and exercising and all of that fun stuff. Even more so, he preferred tighter-fitting clothing that was made of softer, more delicate material. This was the birth of elegant Elliot Offen, a man fueled by his unstoppable desire to be the best he can be, even if it meant attracting some unflattering attention. As such, he began jogging every single day. This caught the attention of many people who ultimately helped him build a reputation within the community, even if it was predicated on infamy. Eventually, word of a man running down the streets of New York with a very feminine-looking butt circulated far and wide enough to be brought to Howard Stern, the host of the eponymous Howard Stern Show. They managed to get in contact with Elegant Elliot in hopes of bringing him onto the show and picking his brain just a tiny bit. What a perfect opportunity for both the show and Elliot, because he had a lot that he wanted to say, and the listeners were all there waiting to have their eardrums romantically massaged by Mr. Offen's dulcet tones. 
Elliot's first appearance on The Stern Show was on the 25th of July 2000. During this visit, a handful of points regarding Elliot's life were touched on. He shared that he had been married three times and divorced three times. I can't imagine why nobody stuck around long enough to see him age so gracefully. Going alongside his absence of romantic engagement, Elliot had not been intimate with another person since June of 1988, about the time his marriage with his last wife had come to a close. I haven't um, had any intimate sexual relationship since my last wife that I was divorced from. Well, how long ago was that? I was divorced from her in 1988 of June. How have you been taking care of that need? Uh, masturbation every day. To remedy his need to get up in some guts, he'd pull his pud to satiate the urges. I'm sure he mastered the traditional art of the two-hand twist. Despite his physical presentation and possibly questionable sexuality, he's actually heterosexual. This shocked everybody on the show because they were positive that he was gay at the bare minimum. But Elliot retorted that he was unequivocally, categorically, and unmistakably straight. You gotta admire a man who's comfortable with who they are and won't take any bullshit from anybody. You Ow. claim to be heterosexual. Unequivocally, are categorically, and unmistakably. Don't you wish you had his level of confidence? I know I do. Howard and his co-host Robin Quivers pried further, desiring to know the deeper intimate workings of the most elegant man in history. Robin continued to poke Elliot with a stick, postulating that he might possibly fantasize about being with a man. But Elliot, being the fervorous straight rock star that he is, exclaimed that he would only fantasize about being with quote voluptuous, sensuous, and sultry looking chicks. If anybody deserved such a stunning partner, it was somebody who ran up and down the street half naked for nearly two decades. He's earned that right. You've never, have you ever been with a man? No, I have not. Do you You've fantasize? Never um, I fantasize, but not with a man. I fantasize with being with voluptuous and sensuous and sultry looking chicks. Right. <laughs> Howard remarked that Elliot looked and sounded feminine, which began to anger Mr. Often. Because of his packed workout schedule and lengthy amounts of back-to-back -back exercise, Elegant Elliot believes himself to be literally the best example of human physique ever. In history. Not even joking. And when I mean ever, I mean literally ever. Like nobody in history could even come close. Nobody ever has or will outdo what he's achieved. No woman on the face of the earth could ever match the curvature of his immaculate, perfectly sculpted structure. Moving along, Elliot was always beefing with somebody, whether it be a Stern Show staffer or a random person that happened to give him a dirty look. Or Joe Corson, but we'll talk about him in a bit. Usually the beef was based on totally innocuous, meaningless, and purposeless reasons. One example was his feud with High Pitch Eric, a high pitched jackass who was arguably worse than Elliot. I put out a video on him some time ago, so if you'd like to learn more about him, you can check that video out. Anyway, the Crazy Cabby vs. Angry Black Saga, yes, that is their names, was happening at this time, leading to a boxing event. A staffer put their microphone up to Eric's smelly maw, wherein he drooled on it and proclaimed that he supported Crazy Cabby and he wanted to challenge Elegant Elliot often in a formal fight, because he believed that Elliot was gay. I guess it was commonplace to exchange pummeling blows over the integrity of somebody's sexuality back then. What a strange world we live in. Elliot rose from his seat, wearing a clean-looking suit which was actually quite a strange thing to see him in, given that he enjoys wearing titillating garb. In his anger, he removed his jacket, prepared to enter the fray with his fragrant challenger. Raising his already head-splitting voice, Elliot said that both contestants in the upcoming match were not physically fit enough to battle, and it would be over in about two rounds, sharing his support for Angry Black. Given that Eric and Elliot both hated each other and supported the opposite sides, this only added more fuel to the fire. Elliot then placed Eric in his crosshairs, yelling into the microphone and cameras that Eric was a quote, neuroblastoma, melanoma, lymphoma, and carcinoma victim. Eric challenged gravity by getting up out of his seat, leading the two to exchanging threats of violence and leaving each other for dead the next time they were to meet. This fight unfortunately never happened, but it certainly would have made for quite the entertaining show. Personally, my money would have been on Elliot. It's hard to take down that kind of crazy. It isn't hard to see why Howard found Elliot just so fascinating. His enigmatic demeanor and distinctive radio presence made him quite the alluring guest. One fantastic example of Elliot's unrivaled entertainment value was when he entered the taxicab saga. This was a short-lived stop in the long story of Elliot's life. At this time, he was still emotionally reeling from having lost a contest on the show. Steve Langford, a reporter for Howard 100 News, followed Elliot and rode in a cab with him for an interview. Elliot couldn't help but accompany his ranting and raving with constant fidgeting, frequently fiddling with the passenger window and jumping out of the vehicle to take his jacket off in the middle of winter of all times. The removal of his jacket is yet another demonstration of his power. He wasn't affected by the temperature like everyone else. He was perfect. Still is, really, and you're not. 
Langford asked Elliot about his ongoing legal battle with his landlord, as Elliot was going to be evicted on December 1st if he didn't leave prior. The audience was then informed that Elliot owed about $20,000 of back rent. I guess he figured out how to temporarily beat the system, not paying the money he was obligated to pay. Don't you think he'd realize after his bust-out scams that eventually you always get caught and debt isn't something that just goes away? It's not something to take lightly. Elliot berated Steve, accusing him of leaving 15 harassing calls and messages on his answering machine. Steve replied that he had called him maybe twice at the most, but it was certainly nothing close to the extent that Elliot was claiming. It's also worth noting that Steve's superior told him to not get in the cab with Elliot, but he did so anyway in hopes of catching another exciting story. But he did at least follow the guideline of not entering his apartment. I've got this hunch that maybe Steve wouldn't have survived that encounter if he had entered Elliot's hovel. He's really somebody you don't want to be stuck with behind a closed door. Despite Elegant Elliot's efforts, Steve continued to endure the verbal assault, hoping to witness the evidence of the alleged 15 calls that he supposedly made, and to see what kind of condition Elliot's shithole was undoubtedly in. Maybe that was poor word choice. Oh well, you get what I mean. Unsurprisingly, Elliot kept articulating on and on, eventually telling Steve that he was going to have to pay for the ride, not Elliot, because someone as elegant as him is far too important to have to spend money on something as frivolous like transportation. It's beneath him. He's no beef stew. The verbal beatings just kept coming. Langford was definitely the dedicated trooper, or rather reporter, but after being advised by his boss once again to avoid stepping inside Elliot's fuck cave, Steve decided to have the cab pull over so he could get out. Elliot did not take this lightly, seeing Steve's actions as a slight against him. How dare someone walk away from him? Elliot swiftly opened his door and crowded moving traffic, causing the door to be hit by another vehicle ripping it directly off of the hinges. What a professional, prepared, and calculated move on his part. He was laughing maniacally, seemingly unfazed by nearly getting squashed like a bug. Elliot of course scurried away before he was held liable. Not like it would have mattered much to him either way. Listen Elliot, I'm going to... Uh... I think we're going to pull over. I figured that. Steve, I told you you were a yellow, gutless, f***less rat, didn't I tell you? Yes. Just pay the cab, Steve. Okay, Elliot. Because I'm getting out. I'm Send us the evidence. I'm coming. Laughing hysterically, often exits the cab, opening the door in traffic without even bothering to look, practically getting killed. Luckily for him and unluckily for the cab driver, the back door is now a crumpled mess. We can only imagine what his apartment looks like. Anyway, let's touch more on some deep lore, shall we? Many years ago, Elliot being the stud that he is, managed to convince a woman to not only sleep with him, but to receive his semen in her crevice, eventually leading to a child slithering out of her hatch just nine months later. Despite what you may think, Elliot is the furthest thing from a model father and on the 29th of March 2001, his alleged daughter contacted the Stern Show and had some choice words for her sperm donor. Elliot showed up sporting a suit, which of course is not his preferred configuration of fabric, but it was an interesting change of pace nonetheless. This change in apparel didn't signify any alteration of his demeanor as he went right to his loud chicanery like he always does. After a moment or two of Elliot moseying around the studio, making his rounds with his stomping and crescendo, his alleged daughter Karen called in. Elliot was not entertained by any of this. As soon as she claimed that Elliot was a crappy father and a liar, he screeched into his microphone, yelling obscenities and demanding to know identifiable information about her, such as her age, residence, what school she went to, that kind of stuff. If it wasn't the early 2000s, I'd say he's trying to figure out the security questions to her personal accounts. Regardless of what she would try to say, he'd yell over her and say that she's a junkie and that she was having a hallucinatory attack of some sort, etc, etc. Elliot claimed that somebody told him some time ago that his actual daughter got hooked on heroin and unfortunately passed. Again, this is just a claim as we have no idea how or why he heard such a thing through the grapevine. All of this intrigued Howard, prompting him to have his producer Gary Delabonte scheduled to get Karen on the airwaves the following day. All he wanted her to bring was her birth certificate to prove the identity of who she claimed to be. Once again, Elliot started ranting and raving, stating that she wouldn't be his daughter because she mispronounced his last name as often instead of often. Tomato, tomato. The following day, Karen and her husband arrived with their faces concealed for their own protection, which is understandable all things considered. She stated that she was beyond embarrassed of her father and would rather not have her face linked to his. Elliot showed up with what he claimed was his courtroom demeanor, as he was going to be cool, calm, and collected, something that is not often expected of him, if ever. Safe to assume his smooth attitude didn't last for long though, right? Karen wanted three minutes to speak to Elliot, uninterrupted, to get her message across, which Elliot agreed to. 
The first memory Karen brought up of Elliot was him in women's clothing, heels, and makeup in all the works, swatting on a cockroach in their apartment. He abused her mother, broke her fingers, and kidnapped Karen when she was two years old. This would have roughly happened on April 3, 1979. Elliot had also convinced Karen that her mother was deceased. Her goal was to inform the world that elegant Elliot Offen was an abusive, dangerous, wife-beating con artist that didn't deserve to make money off of the Stern brand. Elliot followed up by asking his own set of questions. He wanted to know her date of birth, which of course she provided. Howard then interjected that he also had a copy of her birth certificate and that it had the same date on it, and listed Elliot Keith Offen as the father. This was not an adequate response for Elliot, as he attempted to suggest that she may have found the certificate and used it to assume the identity of his supposedly dead daughter. What a likely scenario! He then asked her for a government-issued ID, which Howard was presented with, and of course he confirmed that the name and birth date matched the certificate. Karen ultimately provided everything Elliot wanted, but that just wasn't enough to prove that she was his kin, at least not to him. He instructed her to hold up her left hand, and when she did, he claimed that was proof enough that she was not actually a member of the Offen clan. Turns out, at least according to him, his daughter was born with a missing finger. This woman did not have that. Unfortunately for him, Elliot did not provide any tangible evidence for this, so even if he was telling the truth without having any way to back himself up, there was really no way of taking him seriously, and thus he was wasting his breath. I guess sometimes you really do have to accept that extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. When things were starting to go south in this debate, or whatever you want to call it, Elliot hammered down harder than before, claiming that he never had intimate relations with Karen's mother. Again, this was all hearsay, and so far the narrative was stacked against him. Howard found all of this to be hilarious, offering to have Elliot take a DNA test, but Elliot had better plans, demanding that he be ran through a polygraph test. This fucking guy really thought he was convincing enough that he'd not only sell the idea to them, but to a piece of machinery. I'm sure he would have come out on top, right? After this interview, the Stern Show tried to line up a DNA test for both Elliot and Karen, but both sides had too many conditions that ultimately prevented any testing from taking place. Elliot did, however, call into the show the following day on the 30th to badmouth his daughter once more right before the show's time slot was about to end, leaving him with a very short window to convey his profound thoughts. He claimed that he still wanted to do the DNA test simply because it would prove that he didn't have any sexual relations with Karen, because she isn't his daughter. Not a good look to confess to something heinous like that while also denying it at the exact same time. Don't do it. No fucking gun at my head. I'll put the fucking gun and I'll pull the fucking trigger. I'll put the fucking bullet in your head. Continuing forward, on June 5th, 2001, actor Richard Belzer was in the studio exchanging some dialogue with Howard and Robin, chatting up the callers and spitting some wit when applicable. Elliot, of course, found a way to weasel himself back into the studio. I'm not quite sure how he was so calm, considering that breathing and squawking seemed to serve the same mechanical function for him. The purpose of this visit was to discuss a possible DNA test regarding his alleged daughter, yet again. The day prior, Elliot was mentioned in the local newspaper, supposedly boasting about his body, whatever there is to actually brag about considering his face was just kind of hanging off of his skull. The newspaper report was just a source of pride for Mr. Offen, and understandably so, since he was so far up his own ass. Stern, however, disagreed with the positive sentiments and said that Elliot was looking particularly awful that day, saying something about Elliot's ass sagging and that his legs needed a lift. Offen retorted by saying that Howard was simply lying for the radio. Elliot had a bunch of black makeup on his face and nobody could figure out what exactly he was trying to do. Everyone asked and he continued to yop. Go figure. Let me tell you the one condition, Go genius. Ahead, Let me tell you the condition, genius. Go ahead. Let me tell you the condition, genius. Yeah. Right, I can't hear you. Finally, he touched on stuff regarding the DNA test. He was actually willing to perform the test for less conditions, leaving only one. Since she claimed that he beat her and diddled her, he wanted Karen to come back to the studio and give a detailed retelling of every bad thing that he did. He actually wanted to make her relive her trauma. What a fucking monster. Elliot continued to ramble about his body and Howard kept picking him apart, somehow ending with the two comparing the shape and form of each other's butts and legs. How incredibly heterosexual of him. Moving along, on June 18th, 2002, Elliot appeared in the studio for a little chat after being introduced as a self-proclaimed health expert, a title truly fit for a king like him. This introduction made Elliot feel warm and welcomed by the show's host, but Howard did feel inclined to point out that Elliot didn't have any kind of formal education, certification, or degree, and that Elliot had noticeable eye bags under his peepers. You know, something you likely wouldn't want to be present on your face if you're supposed to be a symbol for healthy living and young looks. Howard felt this was the worst he had seen Elliot, and of course, the guest wasn't too much of a fan of that kind of talk. 
These comments deeply affected Elliot on a personal, emotional level. As you likely understand quite well at this point, Elliot tends to feel all of the emotions all at once, and they're just so… difficult. And elegant. Can't forget that they're elegant. This prompted Elliot to state that while he respected and loved Howard, who he called the financial genius, he would just have to take his headphones off and say goodbye. This is a shockingly calm, collected, and mature response for him. Maybe he was growing as a person. Howard laughed at the whole ordeal and Elliot just walked right out. So to his credit, he was calm for at least one point in his life. That probably took an unthinkable amount of self-control. And for that, I commend him. Because I know Stern has always loved me and I always have loved him. Why can't but I tell you you don't if, look healthy? But, but if I, but you know I do. So you and if look some, like you if, have something and on if, your eyes. And, you if, so, and, and your... if somebody has like brainwashed you into this, you know what I might have to do because my ego is running rampant? I may have to take the headphones off for the first time ever. It's never been done in K-Rock history. And I may have to say, au revoir. Elliot Ellie often just left. Ah, he was so yeah, insulted, funny. he left. <laughs> All right, he is gone. Continuing onward, Elliot was crowned the most hated guest on the 2000th episode of The Stern Show. I have no idea how he earned himself such a controversial title. I mean, he's so quiet and understanding. He took the title about as well as you would expect for somebody who believes they're the personification of perfection. He waltzed in with Violet, his plastic-filled semen demon he's referred to as his secretary and lover, prancing around like he was hot shit. He had gold rings on his fingers, diamonds on those, and of course, he had additional diamonds just hanging from his ears. He was sporting his usual getup of women's clothing that was two sizes too small, chirping like a microwave into a nearby microphone. All in all, it was yet another typical Elliot appearance. Those diamonds and gold that he flaunted were major points of contention for him any time he'd have them on. During this particular appearance, he claimed that they were all collectively valued at $275,000, which I'm sure is a totally realistic and verifiable number. Someone like him, who has no actual job, could just afford that much in the way of jewelry. Seems plausible, right? After blabbering without interruption for several seconds, which is funny considering all he does is interrupt other people, he moved the topic onto his place of residence, which he claimed to be a high-end apartment that was undoubtedly far beyond anything his finances would be able to cover. Between you and I, I think he was struggling to uphold his cocaine addiction, but that really isn't here nor there. Howard repeatedly tried to get a word in edgewise, but Elliot was too commanding of the radio waves. Perhaps he just enjoyed listening to himself, quite the departure from how the show's listeners likely felt about him. Elliot continued to stomp around, showing off his extremely impressive legs and glutes, asserting that the show treated him poorly, especially considering that it was a special event. Turns out, in order to find him, the show had to contact the NYPD because they always seem to know where he is. If you can be found because someone asked the police what you're up to, it probably means you're up to no good. Eventually, Howard asked Violet if she was involved with Often or if there was some sort of special arrangement between the two of them. Elliot and Violet claimed she was actually his secretary, but Stern understandably called their bluff. This angered Elliot further, going back on to speaking about himself and how he's a walking example of $16 million of profound physical fitness. By the time he eventually was on his way out the door, Elliot plugged an independent film project he was working on with his secretary and another woman who he had been involved with prior. It's apparent that if you're someone who is as elegant as Elliot, you have a knack for artistic endeavors, even though they can be tremendous undertakings. So, yeah, about that independent film. Turns out Elliot was a bit of an aspiring independent filmmaker, having produced a visual abortion only known as Violet Dehumanizes Elegant Elliot a 60-minute shit show that doesn't exactly explain anything of value to anybody. He denies having ever told his daughter that her mother was dead. However, he did tell her that she was dead and buried. That is somehow different, I guess. He claims that three men, a Hispanic man, a black fella, and a Russian attempted to rob him, threatening physical violence. He insists that with his overpowering athletic ability that he was able to take them all down with ease. As the film continues, he brings up footage of his alleged daughter talking about him, and he confesses to having kidnapped her and concealing her for seven years. And then he admits to having broken Karen's mom's fingers, but he expresses his wish to have cracked her fallopian tube wide open, somehow. He doesn't exactly elaborate on how that's possible, but I'm not going to doubt him. Elliot confirmed that he kidnapped his daughter right after his divorce with his wife in 1979, but instead insists that her age was three, when she claimed that she was two. This introduces paradoxical issues with the narrative and as such, Elliot's story should be disregarded as fucking nonsense. If you took what he said to be true prior to this, you're a drooling idiot. He kept his daughter out of school so the feds couldn't track him down, as they would be aware if she was in public schooling. 
Perhaps the easiest solution to his problems would have been to turn himself in, or, just hear me out now, maybe he shouldn't have been doing heinous things. That tends to prevent further problems of this nature. But who am I to say? I'm nowhere near as elegant. The topic of law enforcement, of course, gets brought up after this, as Elliot goes into detail about when he was allegedly pinched by the NYPD and the FBI on August 21st, 1988. His lawyer, Herbert Kastner, was supposedly the best porno lawyer in America, who had just so happened to be Offen's attorney. I'd wager porno lawyers are probably pretty crooked people, so if Elliot was telling the truth, he likely knew some pretty unsavory individuals. He proceeded to list the names, positions, and departments of several officers of the law in hopes of shaming them for doing their jobs of prosecuting a dangerous, wacky criminal. The larger backstory to his life that he postulates is one of grandiose proportions, as if he's some kind of criminal mastermind that the federal government worked tirelessly to take down. Yet for some reason, he's just on a video screaming about beef stews and gangster talk. Some of his charges were allegedly federal and state racketeering charges, jumping bail, interstate flight to avoid criminal prosecution, grand larceny, organized fraud, conspiracy to commit grand theft, and kidnapping. All of this was somehow predicated on the $30 million heist that often was adamant that he pulled off. He was captured and placed in Rikers Island Correctional Center, which he stated to be the most dangerous prison in America. Elliot was convicted on RICO charges, landing a 14-year sentence of prison time. This didn't matter much because Elliot was batshit crazy and could just shit out names rapid fire in order to drastically mask his identity, thus making him unrecognizable to the Glowies. Some of the names included Steve Marcus, Jack Gordon, Steve Cohen, Mark Katz, Donald Perry, Steve Fisher, plus many more. He would assume these roles by adjusting his voice to have either a southern drawl or a touch of Yiddish, according to him. Do with that information as you will. Somehow, through his big spending from his incredibly audacious escapades and high-octane highs, he managed to damage the economy irreparably. It couldn't possibly have coincided with world events that affected economic climates, right? Especially considering that his money most likely never existed. I feel like he might be lying. Hmm... Immediately, right after divulging details about his criminal history, he shows a shot of his bent penis, almost pointing at the camera. The cocked angle of his cock is truly a sight to behold. He can certainly make short films, but he wasn't very good at composing shots featuring his tallywhacker. Near the end of the film, he shares even more depraved footage of himself, including, but not limited to, sucking on some feet, getting his mouth covered with duct tape, which is a plus because he's mostly inaudible, so there's no unnecessary language, right? He gets smacked around a bit, including being spanked and having his supple man titty slapped. His nipples were pinched with several clothespins and his nose was abused with a wire brush. He was fucked in his butt with a large dildo with no lubricant in sight. Violet was very happy to cram a rubber penis in her boss's anus. Must have been her dream job. This merely served to showcase Elliot's meager grasp on reality, as it was mostly just him exercising, screaming, telling impossible tales and getting his butthole stuffed. Probably not a wise thing for somebody to have purchased all those years ago, but I am thankful that somebody did and put it on an internet archive. Not quite sure why they felt the need to archive this, but hey, I'm thankful nonetheless. I'm gonna move on so I don't have to think about Elliot's dangling participle anymore. On the first anniversary of Elliot's first appearance on The Stern Show, July 25th, 2001, Mr. Offen decided to stop by the studio to grace the listeners with his crescendo. Over the course of that year, he had made 28 individual appearances, which likely felt more like 250 appearances that lasted four hours each to anybody who had to deal with them. Elliot exposed his chest and gut to show Howard that he had not even the slightest fragment of fat on his body. However, he wouldn't totally remove his shirt for whatever reason. Very strange that the most physically fit and sexiest man alive was strangely not willing to show off his body. It was apparent that this visit was going to be centered around Elliot's unmatched gymnastic capabilities. Howard jokingly told Offen that he had breasts, something to complement his formed feminine buttocks. Elliot reveled in Stern's observation but seemed to take minor offense to the claim that he had titties. Elliot was obviously far too insecure to handle being told that he's got some nice knockers. Elliot was carrying over $1,000 in 20s during his appearance, hoping to give it to whoever can locate Lloyd Offen, his brother, and take him to him. Apparently Lloyd had a pretty gnarly hernia that he needed assistance with and Elliot was going to assist him somehow. Probably best not to question how this would have played out. Lloyd was allegedly supposed to accompany Elliot onto the show so they could talk about how he would let his brother take care of him, commit him to a home, and whatever else. Odds are it wouldn't have been anything interesting to listen to anyway. Often stomped around, pointing his fingers and glaring menacingly as usual at the many cameras and microphones that were pointed in his direction, demanding to see the woman who had claimed to be his daughter once again. He was angry that she never returned for the DNA test, likely because she wanted nothing to do with him, but he needed to continue the ritual of always getting the last laugh, or so he thought. 
For being so confident that she wasn't his daughter, he damn sure wanted to prove it when she was done with all of it. The thing she said really burned him, which shouldn't have happened considering that he is so sure that she's not his kin. Makes you wonder if he might have been lying, huh? If only he knew that words are just words, but that type of logic is probably moot when used on somebody who exclusively uses their outside voice. A man claiming to be a retired detective that had previously worked on a case involving Elliot called into the show to share his opinion on Mr. Offen's personal qualities. The more this man talked, the more the story unraveled and Elliot confirmed the validity of the officer's statements. The former detective shared details on the kidnapping of Elliot's daughter, how he made her beg in the street and participate in his elegant scams. The lawman also shared that Elliot was found under an alias, Jack Gordon, which Elliot confirmed to be true. Perhaps he really was a detective, but Elliot would reveal all of the details necessary to understand the larger plot. <laughs> I never saw somebody so kakexic! <laughs> the man is drained out and washed out like a sponge! Kakexic! The detective claimed that the department had a video of Elliot performing some sort of strip tease for other inmates during his incarceration. I was unable to find such a tape, so maybe I should consider myself lucky. After this was established, the detective said a man named Robert will be calling to Howard. Robert allegedly knew a bit more about Elliot's story. Robert Rand, an Emmy award-winning reporter who had written an article titled King Khan that covered Elliot's story many years ago, called in to share his insights into the psyche of elegance. The details of Elliot's failed bust-out bullshit and the infamy he attained from his actions was given to the audience for them all to enjoy. This served very little purpose as Elliot wasn't exactly embarrassed either. Continuing forward, maybe we should further elaborate on his questionable ethics regarding criminality. In 2006, Elliot found himself in some hot water. Somehow, some way, Elliot had his hands on the steering wheel of a moving motor vehicle that he was also renting. Why anybody would rent a vehicle to him is truly beyond me. Either way, during his commute, he ran over an elderly woman and killed her. From what I was able to find, she apparently was trying to cross the street, and he decided that she would work a lot better as a speed bump rather than a living bystander. It was a complete accident, of course, and when anybody would pry for information, he would have a subsequent meltdown. This attack on the elderly was the focal point of his last two visits to the Stern Show. The first time around, he was mostly calm, ready to tell his side of the story versus what the newsroom had reported. Elegant Elliot was adamant that he was going to give his side, get out and do his thing, and nobody was going to tell him how to do it. The tension gradually rose as Elliot's mannerisms were mimicked by the show's host. Elliot did his absolute best to stall, which honestly didn't take much on his part because he is constantly delaying any possible coherent conversation any time he opens his mouth. This annoyed everyone, with Gary threatening Elliot over the speaker that if he doesn't keep his end of the deal, any benefits the show was giving him would be revoked. Elliot continued to talk shit, bringing up Howard's ex-wife, which angered Robin on Howard's behalf, and she interjected by asking what any of that had to do with Elliot's ordeal. This did not phase Elliot even in the slightest, swiftly telling her to shut up and pointing out that she had a quote, cunt face. Rather than even attempt to touch on the topic of his visit, Mr. Offen continued to bicker with Howard about shit that didn't even relate to anything. He called him a rusty nail, a beef stew, told him he looked like the last shit he took. Elliot's vocabulary was on full display during this bombastic appearance. Eventually, the heat became too much for him and Elliot practiced some unusual levels of self-control by storming out of the studio. Considering his violent past and this was a currently explosive temper tantrum, this was quite the mature decision on his part. Again, this might be character growth. He agreed to appear on the show once more to discuss his ongoing court case. When he arrived, he showed off his body and of course his unique attitude, sporting a particularly sour one that fateful day. Gary asked Elliot if he was still willing to share details about his case, but Elliot replied that he was currently under a gag order and would not be able to divulge in the finer points of his latest run with Elder Homicide. Gary understood and told him to return when the gag was up because he was just causing problems in the hallway and there was nothing to gain if he wasn't going to talk about his case. Rather than speak on the passing of an old lady who was turned into a hood ornament without her consent, Elliot demanded to talk about what he popped Joe Corson in the mouth at the stage delicatessen, leaving him for dead, right? He claimed that the police department, the investigators, and his attorney all told him to zip his mouth because the investigation was not complete yet. Howard was annoyed by this because Elliot was really just wasting everyone's time, responding that often it was lying because cops can't put a gag order on you. Elliot kept pushing back. He just wanted to talk about Joe Corson, right? He left him for dead because he's a fucking beef stew! He swung at the air to demonstrate how tough he was, the cameraman shaking in fear. Elliot's fist flew through the air and collided with a nearby wall, challenging its structural integrity with his mighty strength. 
Now he had damaged the building, and this was bad. On top of this, he was not going to put on a pair of headphones so he could properly communicate with Howard. Howard and Elliot exchanged some harsh words with each other, yelling obscenities back and forth, left and right. Go on the show, I go in the fucking studio, we do it the right way, you hold your cock, and I walk out like the last time, right? Hey, but I don't care, walk out. Goodbye. 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 Fuck you. Fuck you. Fuck you. Just go home. home. I'll take your fucking Come in and talk like a man. Talk like a man. I'll take your fucking teeth out one tooth at a time. This had Elegant Elliot quite shaken up, threatening to sock Howard right in his mouth if he ever saw him on the street. This altercation led to Elliot getting banned from the building, thus ending his tenure on the show. Stern sent some of his staffers downstairs to meet Elliot outside of the building in hopes of getting a better understanding as to what just happened. Apparently, the owners of the building weren't too keen on Elliot's spicy vernacular and his tendency to put holes in walls. Regardless of how hard they tried to get him to finally elaborate on the actual reason why he came in, he hammered down on his Joe Corson story. According to him, many years ago, a man named Joseph Corson was disrespecting Elliot's father, Sam Offen. The battle took place at the stage delicatessen at West 54th Street and 7th Avenue. Joe took issue with Sam, suggesting that Sam was being too slow and negatively impacting the flow of customers into the restaurant, as they needed any table they could get given that they're nestled in the busiest city in the world. Elliot stood up and told Joe to leave his daddy alone and to piss off, eventually hitting him in the head four times before leaving him for dead. His words. What a dangerous, unstoppable bad boy. The fate of his court case landed in his favor, and he's still walking the streets to this day. Elliot has popped up a handful of times since his departure from the Stern Show. There's plenty of videos online featuring sightings of him from fans and unsuspecting civilians alike. But unfortunately, not everybody responds so kindly to Elliot's presence. Seems like history has a way of repeating itself. On December 12, 2015, Elliot was outside of a Brooklyn synagogue on Eastern Parkway in New York. A 20-year-old Hasidic fellow was not happy about Elliot hanging around while sporting some revealing apparel. The gentleman shouted that he was going to cut off Elliot's penis and of course called him gay. Elliot's not gay though, he likes pussy, right? The attacker was arrested and charged with assault as a hate crime and aggravated assault as a hate crime. This was also tied to an alleged event where the same man verbally attacked Elliot some months prior. He was attacked again in 2017. Elegant Elliot was heading down a street in Crown Heights shortly after midnight. For once, he was actually driving a vehicle, cruising down the street, not hitting old women, which in my opinion is pretty shocking, but whatever. Anyway, someone threw a bottle at his car, threatened his life, and shared a few unkind words and slurs. The perpetrator was never caught. But it didn't stop there, as in March of 2022, Elliot was jogging in the Upper East Side as he always does, when two assholes called him some names and tossed an unidentified white substance onto the back of Elliot's head. One of them even said they were going to get a gun and harm him. The identities of the men who attacked him were never revealed, and the white stuff was never properly identified due to Elliot being unresponsive to inquiries. These days, Elliot has tried to move on to the internet as Miss Elegante, but that potential venture has unsurprisingly collapsed. He often fluctuates between referring to himself as Miss Elegante, to Elliot often, to anything else really. His identity now seems to be a bit more fluid, having caught up with the times I guess. People on social media sometimes record their encounters with him. The occasional unfunny nobody podcast might bring him on, but it pales in comparison to his time on The Stern Show. Yes, Elliot is a monster who has done terrible, reprehensible things, but there is no denying that he was a gift to radio. His unmatched crescendo and explosive appearances made him a guest to remember, even if people got tired of his behavior pretty quickly. Compared to some of the other members of the WAC Pack, Elliot stands out as the most vocally powerful and moving member of the group. Who would have thought the King of Khan would have made such a lovely addition to a peculiar radio show? Maybe someday we'll get someone just as entertaining as him in the spotlight once more. But for now, we can enjoy the pleasant memories. Elliot's appearances are some of my favorite excerpts from The Howard Stern Show, and I hope this video will inspire you to take the time to listen to some of his visits. Maybe you'll enjoy them as much as I do. But that being said, that's going to be it for today's video. If you like what I do, leave a comment, rate, and subscribe. If you want to support me in a more personal way, you can check out the Patreon link and the Teespring link in the description. I've got more content coming down the pipeline. But until then, I'll see you degenerates next time.